Hello there, my name is David. I'm from the South London Mental Health and Community Partnership, and we're three mental health trusts working together. Um, I wanted to share with you our story working with universities south of the river in London. Um, we cover an area um, of three and a half million people, so it's a large system. And um, we came together with the idea of how can we take a new look and a new approach at trying to improve students' mental health and well-being. Um, as you know, for many of us in the NHS and for you in the higher education sector, COVID um, changed our plans, changed everything in a way. Um, and in, it's put a little bit of a halt to our, to our project. But we've come quite a long way already. Um, we've found out, discovered quite a lot, and we've planned quite a lot and had a lot of new ideas. Um, so we wanted to share this with you and most of all to get your feedback, your views, your expertise, and see what you think of our plans uh, whether they've still got resonance and what you do um, to improve things now. So I'd like to share a brief presentation with you. Um, I would ask that um, please feel free to uh, post comments, post questions uh, at any time. Um, we'll, uh, we will um, take questions at the end and I'm delighted that I'll be joined by Sue who's Associate Director of Student Services at Goldsmiths University, um, to take your questions and talk a little bit more about how we work together. Um, so please do this. Um, do appreciate there are a couple of slides in here where the, um, there are some diagrams um, showing the system. Um, they're not hugely uh, visible on a small screen, but we will share the full presentation with you. And at any stage um, in the future, I'm very happy to talk through the detail of those. And of course, anything else with people one-to-one, -one, if that's how you prefer. So let's start on our, um, our journey. So why do we need to change? Um, you'll be well aware of the well-rehearsed and well-known issues around students' mental health. Um, the demands uh, on NHS services are increasing um, at all levels. Um, and we know that the demand on student services, student welfare services are increasing as well. Um, and this is um, some very serious uh, issues around uh, suicide attempts, self-harm, depression, crises, A&E attendances, um, through to a demand for um, all levels of, of well-being and mental health support, um, from counselling to signposting, um, and things that don't, uh, don't approach um, NHS trust services. Um, but we know there's a challenge there, when we know, of course, that there's many factors approaching and affecting uh, students' mental health, environmental factors, social, financial, exam pressures, um, peer pressures, isolation, change, um, the age group that they're in, where a lot of first incidents of, of mental health conditions can happen. Um, and at all, at all levels, really, from, um, from anxiety um, and relevant and um, other uh, associated uh, challenges that people face right through to more serious mental health conditions and, and issues. Um, so we know that's the case. We also know there's been a huge um, uh, impact of COVID on, on young people. Um, King's College London, um, of which the Institute of uh, Psychiatry, Psychology and Neurology, um, world famous uh, research uh, academic department is part of that, has a huge uh, survey that is on ongoing of around 100,000 people looking at various psychological issues. Um, and they have uh, flexed that in, in, in the last year into a, into a subsection of, um, called uh, the coping study. Um, and of that cohort, they've been asking questions around how they've uh, responded in COVID. Um, and we know from that that a huge, uh, huge cohort who answers their survey each, each time, around about 30,000 people, which is a vast, vast cohort, um, they've discovered that there's a very much an inverse proportion according to the age of people to the effect uh, of COVID on their mental health and well-being. So much so that um, some 75% uh, of 19 to 35 year olds said their mental health and well-being um, has deteriorated, has worsened during COVID. Um, by, that's by far the, um, the largest proportion is, is of young, young people. Um, so we know that's the case. Um, we'd love to know your experiences. Has it affected your students? Has it affected how you look after your students? Um, be really interesting to know so please please share that with us we know there's a lot of research out there from all sorts of institutions organizations uh, sector bodies um, and within within the university sector itself um, but what we wanted to do was consider what are the what are the solutions 
Um, and our starting point was, can we come together? So uh, we're three NHS trusts, Oxleys, um, which covers uh, the southeast of London, uh, South London and Maudsley, which covers sort of the south central area, um, and southwest London and St George's, which covers um, most of the southwest of London as far as at Richmond on one side, across to Croydon, inner London, uh, Lambeth, Southwark, and across to Bexley um, and Greenwich on the, on the other side in the southeast. And that's in total, that's about 3.6 million people um, in total. So there's a lot of services, a lot of specialists, a lot of community inpatient support and, and specialist services as well. Um, but what we did know is that um, we knew that there was a, a challenge for students right through from prevention and intervention through to those um, attending and, and accessing services, increasing demand on GPs uh, and on, on the services of mental health trusts and other parts of the health sector. And we knew from, um, from uh, student welfare professionals there was a demand on their services uh, by far. And we've all seen the very sad and um, uh, impactful uh, reports uh, of issues all around the country at universities. Um, so we thought what could we what could we do? We came together, we, we formed a group um, of our three trusts of senior psychological clinicians, of, of, of nurses um, and of operational experts, um, with student, um, student support and student welfare experts, some academic leads, um, uh, general senior managers, and we came together and we started thinking about what, what are the issues. To start with, we, um, we shared our experiences and we shared our own perspectives. And we realized that whilst we were over here dealing with one part of the problem, the universities were over here very much dealing with a huge uh, wealth of um, problems and challenges and all, all of the issues that come with running uh, institutions for around 140,000 um, students per year, plus a, a high number of staff as well. Um, and we know we were sort of operating in, in, in isolation, but we couldn't we couldn't improve the situation whole in isolation. Could we uh, could we improve things together? So we had some early discussions. We had some early thoughts about what are the challenges and opportunities. Um, but what we really want to do is, is to um, validate our thinking and our thoughts, um, and also to speak to um, students themselves. So we committed to doing some research. Um, we did some surveys. Uh, we asked them for, for, their, for their views. Um, these validated a lot of the, the national researchers out there that, that a lot of students, although they wanted to go to um, GP practice and they know where to go, they had a concern within their university or their, or their the GPs. A lot aren't registered with, with GPs uh, at university um, and they would welcome uh, an NHS support. Um, so we took, we took a lot from the survey findings and we know there's a lot of research out there. Um, but what we want to do is see what are the solutions and what, what the students themselves want. And that's where we, we brought students together from uh, quite unusually from a series of different universities from five different universities. I think we represented at our one day um, workshop and, and we took a very much a, a joint co-design co-production approach. Um, we asked students everything from what, what made good customer experience in life in general. And interestingly, the Amazon experience came out very highly of a digital first, um, digital escalation if there's an issue, uh, and then telephone contact if that needs to be solved as well. They wanted a smooth, uh, smooth customer journey, um, but did, did, with a sort of a digital first interface to that, that was their the general view of, of what makes really good customer service across lots of, across lots of sectors. Um, and we then asked them to talk through the student journey and when were the trigger points um, in a way for their sort of well-being, their happiness, uh, for how they're affected, what those, what those things were, what affected them. Uh, we asked them what made them happy and what were the influences that made them improve their well-being in, in life, at university life, and what were things that um, negatively impacted them. Um, we asked them their experience, um, but we didn't we just want to know people's experience. We wanted to know how they wanted things to happen, how they would like things to be better. And these are some of the things that came out of that um, as we moved on to the latter part of the day um, and had a fantastic, exciting day with students designing what they would want from an integrated system and service. So they wanted digital access and support. They wanted a single point of access, um, which we know is a challenge across the NHS across all sorts of public services and, and areas. Um, if you have a have a problem, you want to go somewhere and be uh, go to the, that first 
point of contact you need to know that you're in safe hands and that you will reach the right destination as soon as possible not be telling your story lots of times over and, and move from pillar to post signposted here back there etc and um, so they wanted a, that ease of ease of access which very much chimes with our, our aims in the nhs to give people the right care the right term the right place but clearly that care didn't necessarily mean or that intervention didn't necessarily mean um, coming to the NHS, it could be delivered in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and in fact, um, what we also want to know is they, they wanted to know um, that there was stuff and support all the way and all around them uh, with their well-being. So they may not actually experience some um, periods of, of particular mental and well-being, but when they did need support, it would, it would be there. So they wanted some transparency and clarity if they were waiting, if they had been referred into a service, whether that was a peer service, student counselling, um, apt um, psychological therapy type services delivered by the NHS or more specialist services. Um, they wanted that to be digital, to be phone, to be walk-in, but as long as it was a single uh, route and a clear clear way to getting what they wanted, they wanted that. And then they wanted a variety of options for their well-being, some of which, which are, are things that NHS has very little to do with and some of which are things that universities clearly can't provide a highly specialist mental health services for. Um, and they wanted that to be managed throughout the journey, um, to be informed. Um, and that was one of the really interesting things that we took out of that. The starting point for the student journey is way before they've uh, applied to the university, way before they've um, uh, considered even which university to go with. They want to know right at that sort of that sort of start before they visited or or, or decided or uh, any any course or whatever, just to have some understanding of the type of issues maybe that would. Um, it would affect them um, and may affect their mental health and well-being being away from the home for the first time um, the potential financial pressures um, living in different surroundings uh, being in a different community um, all of those sorts of things that anchor points things that would cause change um, and life change and different life experiences that might affect your, your well-being and your happiness and they wanted some openness and transparency around that which is an interesting question that you might have some views on as well um, is at what stage, um, as well as part of that information and support you give students about their their study, their um, accommodation options, their costs, their, all of the various practical elements of student life, um, the things they may want to do, the activities, etc. Um, what about uh, the mental health, the well-being impacts, and how they need to care for and look after themselves, and what support is not just available, but how it may impact them, what they need to, to look for. Um, so there was there was that feeling um, that we know there is in heightened uh, awareness of mental health that you should be looking after yourself and that you know um, a lot a large portion of us at some stage of our life will will all have mental health and we may well have um, some form of issue concern at, at all sort of levels but how do we um, how do we communicate that to students and help them prepare and they want that preparedness that openness which is interesting and it's an interesting one for student services as well. So I suppose we'd say, do these resonate with you? What has uh, what has what has changed um, since COVID? What extra pressures are on there? What's affecting students now? Um, as I say, we we know a lot about this. Um, we know a lot about the problems, um, and we can admire the problems. But could we come up with the solutions? Can we, uh, by working together, improve things? And as three trusts, that's where we've uh, we've discovered um, working in partnership and in collaboration. Uh, rather than in competition, as we sometimes used to do for, for, for contracts for services with, with commissioners. Working together at scale, we can do a lot more together. We can bring all our resources together. We can do consistency of access, consistency of the quality of care and the best practice, um, and really make innovation and good practice spread and, and get those economies of scale. So we had our early thoughts, and what we came up with was, can we have a, a sort of a fully integrated approach that doesn't say this is an NHS problem, this is a university problem, this is a public health problem, this is a combined opportunity to work together to do things differently, a holistic and an integrated approach. We set out some aims, which I, I won't read through, but they're fairly sort of clear. Um, and there were some very, very, very broad ones around it. We want to improve everybody's mental health and well-being, student and staff alike, and to make support uh, services accessible and, and to help people continue their studies and then enjoy them. Um, and for, for as an NHS, um, you know, we want we want like everybody else to see reduced um, mental health conditions and people having really bad experiences. 
So we also came up with some principles, how we'd work together. And again, I would, I would focus on that integrated system um, from interventions, awareness, prevention, through to um, the actual support that's needed, um, but making sure that was designed jointly by uh, students themselves, by you as a student support experts and by, um, and by our, own, our own staff as well. Um, and that needed to be across the piece. We came up with a, a sort of a three-tiered approach, really. Um, and to summarise this, there are some um, some examples of one of the, the levels that follow. Um, but the, the, there was a the whole environment that people come into, the students come into, um, and everything that goes along with that. And a lot of that is the responsibilities of the of the universities to um, to uh, to provide for themselves from the design of, of how they teach their buildings, their support services. Um, that whole environment um, with well-being under mind. As part of that, if people did need support, we wanted to have a, a single point of access principle, however that was delivered. And then when those interventions were required, what we called our level one services, they could include existing services provided by universities, maybe in partnership with us, maybe through GPs, maybe peer support, but making sure we have some good standard benchmarks of, of quality and consistency. Or they could be a uh, tailored interventions provided by us. Um, for example, the IF model, but very much in a HG context for the specific issues and, and challenges that people in their peer group face. Um, and taking into account all of those influencing factors in our cultures, different ages, different challenges, um, and, and, and accessibility at the, the core of that. Um, and, and digital access to what you need, right care, right support, right time on place principles. And the level two services were very much the sort of the core services that, that the NHS provides. Um, and a key element of that is making sure that there is a pathway back into studies uh, that people um, share support information and that we help help right through the pathway. So if under that unfortunate circumstances somebody did need to attend A&E um, or they did need to call a, a crisis helpline that was dedicated to AG students, um, that we uh, enabled them to continue their studies um, and set up whether that was the data sharing, the protocol, or just the best practice to make sure that people, um, they had a single point of access still and we cared for them and they had that contact all the way through and there was sort of a consistent approach to care, not an episode, and then wait for the next episode to happen. We, we maintain that support for services. Um, and here's um, a few examples of that, uh, the sort of the student environment. We had to take all of these different um, things into consideration. Um, there's lots of different issues uh, and inputs to consider um, and there's some examples of these here from national policy, the data that's local, that's national, um, some of the experiences that are unique to students transition and that's not just transition between um, being uh, children and adolescents into adulthood but it's transition right through all of the university. It's a very transient, um, transient environment in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of research out there, there's a lot of trends out there, um, and there's a lot of things we need to take into account. But then what would a, what would a, a, a system look like? It would need the right policies, um, and consistency is very important, consistent standards, consistent access, 24 access, reasonable adjustments, things that we could help with, things that the universities would very much put into place, and that support and that environment in the university itself, where we could help um, universities with that, but where they could make sure wherever they were, and across the, across the uh, whole of the South London that people had equal access, equal access and opportunity and um, support and services. Um, there's things that we knew we didn't need to recreate or we didn't want to. We know there's over 360,000 different health and wellbeing apps out there. We don't need another one in there. But what we might be able to do is create a consistent uh, gateway in digitally into a single point of access to our contact centre. We all identified that equipping university staffs would be very important with training and support so they could um, they could respond. We know that prevention, early intervention, there's lots of ways through technology and through equipping people um, to help there. Uh, and that was a joint endeavor where we could equip people and there's a key role for everybody within, within that. There's the services on campus um, and then there's this single point of access principle I've talked about before that we'd really like to, like to be able to stand up um, so that it's a tailored tailored support solution. There'll be some very clear new features and some examples of this would be um, big large-scale training, 
a 24-7 contact centre, digital and telephone, that will be everything from crisis to information to uh, assessment and triaging, um, and that will be staffed by mental health professionals and would give that consistency of approach and, and, and immediate access out of hours and at the key times to students um, and advice and support to, to staff as well. Um, a, a pathways with a consistent triage and assessments and access to the right the right level of support and making sure that was a consistent pathway everywhere. So students, wherever they came from, wherever they lived, wherever they are in South London, they get the, the support they need. And there may be some bespoke therapeutic interventions, perhaps uh, as I mentioned, the versions of IAPT and uh, training is absolutely is absolutely vital to people, staff to feel, to feel confident in the difficult situations that they face as well. So all in all, it, it's a it's a new way of working. It's a new way of thinking about things, a system approach, um, moving out of our our own spaces and coming together. So we work together. We progress to. Uh, business case um, and we developed that and um, we thought that was a, a really strong, uh, strong proposition um, and we started those discussions with um, the universities and our own commissioners at senior levels thinking how we build this in maybe into planning for the future and what it would look like um, from all elements. Very complex, uh, complicated um, proposition but some real clear actions that we could do. Then Covid came along um, and to be fair, we know the challenges that you've had and are continuing to have as universities. And you will be equally aware, I'm sure, of the challenges we have in the NHS, in mental health, in acute, in primary care, in, in all parts of it. Um, so we're a little bit on hold at the moment, but we're still very much live and thinking about this. And what we want to do is get views of experts and, and people out there who've got that experience that you've got as well. Is this still re relevant? What more, what new, what's changed? What else could we, could we need? Um, have your plans changed? And what are the priorities if we were to do two or three things out of everything we want to do in this academic year uh, where budgets are going to be tighter than ever, um, where we're all being squeezed, we're recovering from that demand for our services, whether that's student support services or mental health services with, with increases in both, no doubt, to come as the new academic year approaches and the post-pandemic or post-lockdown impacts become clearer. Um, so what are those priorities? What things can make an immediate difference out of our, out of our plans? And that's pretty much where we are at the moment. I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. Appreciate all of your time. Um, that's the end of the formal presentation part of this. Um, very much look forward to um, reading your comments, hearing them. And myself and Sue uh, will be um, available in a few minutes to discuss them with you, to answer your questions. Um, and if you want to um, discuss any further offline or one-to-one -one or give me your thoughts or have any further queries, please email me on the uh, email address there. Thank you very much again and um, look forward to speaking to you.